Hmm, I'm bored. Let's read a book. <laughs> Gearlock whinnied. He was still protesting when I checked on him after a breakfast of three overpriced and overbaked corn muffins, eaten next to two hungover and scowling cavalry troopers. As usual, Justin was nowhere around, having left with the dawn and some wizardly errand. My haste in downing the leaden starch may have contributed to the growls from my own guts that nearly drowned out Garlock's gut-level protests. Plain hay is just not enough for you, fellow. I set the saddlebags on the stall barrier, checking to see if my old saddle and the worn blanket remained where I had racked them. Proof, either that the inn was honest or that my gear was worth less than that of other potential victims. My still-shielded staff remained tucked in the stall corner, but I did not actually handle the wood, since the shielding disappeared whenever my hands touched it, unless they cast the larger shield. Better was all that the Grey Wizard had said about my concealment efforts, and that admission had seemed grudging enough. My stomach and Garlock protested at the same time. Thud. The soft scream from outside the stable might have gone unnoticed between Garlock's protests and my conversation except for the sound of the impact. With little thought, I grabbed my lo no longer invisible staff and burst from the stable, looking around the courtyard. Not only was the courtyard momentarily vacant, but I heard nothing for an instant. Now... The voice came from the alleyway, and like many other perfect fool, I followed the sound until I came across two well-dressed bravos, two rods so, so toward the town center, standing in the morning shadows. Both looked up and toward me, the shorter one on the right releasing a woman in ripped clothing, then pushing her to the brick wall behind him. The taller one already had his sword out, but he looked at me and then my staff and laughed. You're already dead, boy. He gestured to his companion, the one who held the woman. Let's go, Blydlo. Without even looking at me or the huddled heap on the bricked pavement of the alley, the two strolled, almost arrogantly, toward the far end of the alley. The end onto some sort of square where I could see wagons and horses passing. Around where I stood, looking from the backs of departed bravos to the huddled and silent figure against the bricks, the back walls and iron barred doors of the homes or businesses remained steadfastly closed. The alley deserted. I shifted my study to the woman, who looked at me blankly, unmoving. Although her black eyes moved from my face to my staff and back, tears oozed from her eyes and her lips were tight. A reddish abrasion covered most of her left cheek, as if her face had been scraped against the rough brick walls. Her clean, white, and plain blouse had been ripped open across the front. She hunched her shoulders and crossed her arms as if to cover her breasts, partly revealed by the treatment accorded to her garments. Despite the gray streaks in her hair and the pocket marks on her face, the gaps in her garments showed more of a slender and curved figure than she would have wished as she eased herself into a sitting position without using her hands. Both wrists hung oddly, and the tears continued to seep from her eyes, though her mouth was set firmly against the pain. Do with me as you will, black devil. Your days are numbered now. I must have gasped. Here the woman had been beaten, assaulted, and nearly raped. And I had saved her from that possibly worse treatment, and I was a black devil. The Viscount will catch you. I shrugged, feigning a calmness I didn't feel. Since I might as well have hung for a wolf as a sheep, I set 
down the staff and gently let my fingers touch her wrists. What exactly I did, I couldn't say, except that with what I had learned from working the sheep, and with something from what I had read, my mind put enough of the pieces together. My thoughts and senses touched the bones and the flows of orders and disorders that wound through and around her system. Oh, she repeated more softly, gazing at her straightened wrists. They're not fully healed, and I can't tell you when they will be exactly. Just be careful. At that, or because of the sudden lack of chaos within her system, she fainted, leaving me with yet another problem, and probably the local witch patrol gathering to collect my scalp. No one was going to be pleased, not the way things were going. Not Justin, not the Viscount, not the beaten lady. Though she would be younger and more attractive than she had been in years when she healed. And certainly not me. Even though I couldn't leave her unattended in the alley, that meant staggering back to the stable with Lady Anne's staff and hoping no one saw. What have you there? bellowed the old and rotten ostler, appearing from nowhere as I crossed the courtyard. A lady of dubious virtue, and in the morning yet, chortled the formerly sour cavalryman. Share your prize, young fellow? First, have to collect. Justin appeared in the stable door, a bemused expression on his face. Bemused, until he saw the roof close in the bruised face. A healer? he asked. I shook my head firmly. Rest. Bring her in here, Justin shook his head. Not in my stable. A quick something passed from the Grey Wizard to the ostler, who shoved the coin into his belt. I have to check on feed, he grinned at me broadly as he headed for the main street. The cavalryman half grinned, half scowled, but made no move to inspect the merchandise as I stumped into the stable. What did you do? Hissed Justin. Nothing much, I laid the woman on a loose pile of hay. Not at all gracefully, trying to talk and not gasp as I caught my breath. I felt drained as if I had to run a K or so in heavy sand. You idiot! You healed her! How many people saw the staff? Worse than that, you staff. Bravos, then she cursed me. Healed her anyway. I began to put the blanket back on Garlock. Justin turned to the stable boy, standing there, open-mouthed. Without a gesture, the youth collapsed onto the straw. What are you doing? Putting him to sleep. You'll get the credit, provided you get out of here soon enough. Leaving before the Viscount arrives at the local witch patrol? The wizard stared at me. How do you plan to get by the city guards? Can they stop what they don't see? Justin shook his head, then walked over to saddlebags. Keep saddling. I kept saddling. Gerlock didn't even whinny. Here, Justin helped tie a large canvas sack of provisions behind the saddle. Nothing special, just faded and heavy gray canvas. Filled almost to overflowing, the contents had to represent a goodly portion of Justin's stocks. Then he concentrated, and the stack appeared to vanish. Remember to do that. It makes you less of a target. I'll get your pack. I finished chintzing the shuttle and put the staff in place, then remembered to weave the light around the staff so that it, too, appeared to vanish. I wasn't really weaving light, but changing the way the light reflected from the wood and steel. And the steel was the hardest part. A lot of steel and you couldn't avoid the heat wave effect that was clearly the case with the Brotherhood ships. By the time I had Gearlock ready, Justin slipped back through the stable doorway, carrying my pack and cloak. You better get moving. What will you do? He smiled sadly. What apprentice! You're a free wizard who deceived everyone. Thank you. I didn't mean for disowning me, but he understood it anyway. I just hope you learned something from all this. You're going to have to cross to the East Horns. 
but you should be able to handle it if you take the south pass. That's the one that the south road from Jellico leads to. Now get on Gearlock and make yourself unseen. He shook his head again. And don't let anyone touch you. If they have a sense of order, it could unravel the reflective pattern. And please, read the introduction to your book before you try anything else. Those were the last words from the Grey Wizard, as I sat on Gerlock and wove reflections around us. Gerlock didn't like being blind, neither did I. Easy fellow, I patted his neck. I patted him again. Sitting astride Gerlock was strange when I could see nothing except a featureless black. Sounds penetrated, but not sight. But we couldn't just sit there, so I nudged Gerlock with my heels and we stepped out blindly into the courtyard. Slowly, since I could not sense people or objects unless they were close to us. Gerlock's hooves sounded like thunder in my ears. Stable boy. Where's the stable lad? The chestnut needs a rub down. We eased around the rotund porter, hugging the brick wall of the alley until we were in the street. I turned Gerlock southward, around the central square. The eastern gate was the closest, but instinctively, I felt that we had to cover within Jellico, at least until they talked to either the woman or the stable boy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss out on any of my videos. See you on the next one. Goodbye!